Right. In 2007, I became a father. That's me. I've got long hair back then. I've, I've had a, uh, a few years of my wife dressing me now, so <laughs> it starts looking respectable. Um, but it was very quickly obvious to us that our son wasn't quite um, the same as a lot of his other compatriots, his friends. Um, in fact, that's not necessarily a big surprise when you think who his father actually is. Um, but it turned out that in 2011, he was diagnosed with autism. Um, we came over here, and uh, that actually was incredibly helpful for him. It allowed him to get the kind of educational support he needed, and it helped us to understand his condition and find him the help that he needed to, um, to deal with things. Right? But back then, in 2011, I wasn't quite the in, enlightened individual that stands before you right now. I, I was a, a man, and um, men want to fix things. And the only way I could see to fix things was to use my expertise, my expert opinion, my, my research, my science, to try and do something about his condition. Now, um, I'm a microbiologist. I look at bacteria. I specifically uh, look at the bacteria that are inside each one of you. I, um, I'm, I'm very good at my job, and I'm, I'm very interested in my job. It's a, it's a pleasure to get up in the morning. Um, and those bacteria, um, you're full of them, are incredibly small. We just heard about the invisible, where you can't see the bacteria around you right now. Each one of you, each one of you right now, is emitting around 38 million bacterial cells into your surrounding as you speak, as you sit. Um, uh, you're all actually sharing bacteria. And for the germaphobes in the room, that might be a little bit disconcerting, but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll understand that that is actually a really good thing. Okay? Now, um, you have around 100 trillion of these organisms living inside you right now. So if you thought that 100 billion galaxies was a lot, well, it's, it's a small astronomical number. Astronomical numbers are very small. It's the biological numbers you have to worry about. 100 trillion bacteria in every single human, okay? And they weigh around three pounds of your body mass. So if you ever want to get rid of that last three pounds that's annoying you, just take a lot of antibiotics. might kill you, but, you know... At least you'll die thin, right? Um, <laughs> what we're finding out is that these bacteria are incredibly important for your health, okay? So this is a mouse. Um, you can see it sitting on top of a high platform. And we, as researchers, do experiments with animals in order to try and understand how things work in humans, okay? Now, our bacterial communities actually have evolved with our bodies. And this will be apparent later when I talk about humans, but this mouse, as every other mouse in the world, evolved in a sea of bacteria. When we take the bacteria away from the mouse, it starts to show weird abnormalities. Those are physiological abnormalities and even behavioral abnormalities. In this mouse system, I place this mouse in a box either side of this elevated level platform. The platform is about a meter off the ground. And when I place the mouse in a box, what do you think the mouse should do if it's, a, uh, if it's a normal mouse? Yeah? I, I, I couldn't hear a word you said. So you're obviously not as good as the kindergartners I teach. But they would say to me, those children would tell me, the mouse would stay scared. He would hide in the box because that's what a mouse does. The mouse that was brave and ran away and, and hid out in the plain field um, got eaten by the hawk. The mouse that stayed hidden... That mouse procreated and created more mice and ad infinitum. When I take all of the bacteria away from one of these mice, I call it a germ-free mouse, okay? It's got no bacteria associated with it at all. That mouse won't stay hidden inside the box. It will run out of that box and explore its surroundings as if it's lost all of that anxiety, all of that fear of being eaten. It's now become a brave mouse to anthropomorphize it. It's now become a mouse that lacks the fear that has driven it to become the organism it is. We take the bacteria away from a mouse, and the mouse behaves differently. It behaves in an abnormal way, a way that isn't successful if you want to survive out in the wild. And what's interesting about this is we're also finding 
that the, not only can bacteria change your behavior, but they can also change your physiology. We know that I can take the bacteria from an obese person and I can place it into a mouse, and without any other variables being considered, that mouse will put on weight. Okay? So the mouse is gaining weight because of the bacteria inside it. And we've uh, taken those bacteria from somebody who has already gained a lot of weight. And I can actually take the bacteria from that now obese mouse and put it into another mouse, and that mouse will gain weight. And I can take the bacteria from a skinny mouse and put it back into this obese mouse, and the mouse will start to lose weight. So it's the bacteria in our gut that are affecting the amount of energy we take in from our food and basically changing what happens to that energy. It changes how that energy is processed, whether it's stored as fat tissue or whether that energy is burnt off. And what we're finding is that the bacteria in our body can do all of these amazing things. They can have fundamental influences upon our physiology and even upon our neurological behavior. But I'd ask, where do those bacteria come from? It's a fundamental question. You're all sharing bacteria right now, and some of you in the front may be sharing more of my oral bacteria than you're necessarily wanting to. I'm sorry about that. But um, What's interesting is those bacteria come from your mother, the vast majority of them. And if you're born via a natural delivery, you will acquire bacteria from your mother's birth canal. Okay? If you're born via cesarean, you'll acquire bacteria from your mother's skin. Two very different playing fields in terms of the starting culture that you receive at birth. And we want to understand how that starting, pardon me, that starting culture, what it does to affect our health, to affect our development. And if we can augment it, if we can change it. Now, we even know that bacteria are found in mother's milk. So we actually find bacteria in the breast duct. And so when, when mother's lactating and she's feeding baby the milk comes along with its own probiotic. Think about that. You don't need to go down to Whole Foods. Mother's already giving you a probiotic from birth. That's, that's a fundamental level of development that allows the baby to take in new bacteria that are ideal for processing that new food stuff it's experiencing, but are also ideal for training that baby's immune system. But not everybody can have a natural birth. Not everybody can breastfeed. And so we're starting as scientists to identify therapies that we can use in order to augment this experience. Now, when you go through life, you don't just uh, appear in the world and get your mother's bacteria. You appear in a rich and diverse ecosystem. And the rich and diverse ecosystem we grew up in, like the Ameri Indians who, um, who live in uh, um, uh, the Amazon rainforest, um, used to be incredibly diverse. It was an incredibly rich biological experience. It came across with one or two problematic side effects, um, like extreme levels of um, infant mortality, which is obviously not a good thing. But in our modern world, we've, we've managed to, with the, with the help of vaccines and with public health works, we've managed to reduce the impact of those kinds of diseases that would normally knock back our children. So our children are now surviving. But what we've failed to do is carry along that rich, biodiverse experience that our ancestors had, and, you, and experience it in our everyday world. What we've got now is an erosion of our biological diversity. And our biological diversity is made of bacteria. We live in these climate-controlled rooms with, with our cleaning products and our um, antibiotics and our, and our um, uh, desire to make sure that everything is as sterile and clean as possible. And we're told that. Over the last hundred years, our advertisers have told us that you know, we want to kill all known germs dead. That's the only way to keep your family safe. Remember that. It's not necessarily true. And in fact, the more evidence we find, we realize that actually that sterilization of our experience may actually be affecting the way our bodies develop in interesting ways. So, for example, if we look at allergies, the experience that we evolved with, this rich biodiverse experience, has been eroded by living indoors, by our work and play environment being changed, and by our use of antibiotics and cleaning products, which kill the good bacteria along with the bad. And this may have reduced our bacterial diversity and actually left us open to um, maybe developing allergies and asthma. And those good bacteria that live inside us are excellent for training our immune system to respond appropriately to the right kinds of organisms. So as scientists, we're trying to figure out ways to put those good bacteria 
back into our modern day experience so that our bodies can respond appropriately. Now, problem foods such as peanuts, cow's milk, these are things that people are allergic to. And I, I, we run a clinic at the University of Chicago where I work um, that brings in children all the time who have these crippling allergies. And we see more of these allergies in our Western world than we do in worlds that don't experience the same kind of sterile environmental exposure. So um, what we're finding out is that when we add the right kinds of bacteria back into the experience of a child, we can actually prevent them from developing this allergy. Help. we can even reverse their allergy. If they're cow's milk allergic now, we can add a probiotic and significantly alleviate their allergic system. And that's really exciting. That means we can manipulate the system. But it's not the only component of this. When we, when we look at um, the experience of a population, this is an Amish farm um, in northern Indiana. And there are, there are a few 10,000 or more Amish ch people living um, in northern Indiana. And they, they grew up there. As, a, as a group, they grew up in Eastern Europe. They grew up in um, an agrarian society, living with their animals, working with their animals, and they, they brought that kind of lifestyle over to the US. No one in this entire Amish population suffers from a food allergy. Their, their rate of asthma is minuscule. It's almost absent from their population. The US average is around 6 to 7%, but the Amish have less than 0.1%. And that's fundamentally important to our to our understanding of what's going on with these people. They, they've got some kind of protective influence from their environment, and it's changed them. It's changed how their bodies are responding to the system. You'll see a six-year-old girl walking out with a 1.5-ton shire horse. The children are working on the farm. It's influencing their development. And this may be incredibly important for life. I take my kids down to this farm, and we, uh, we rub their faces in the dirt just in case, you know. <laughs> That's... Maybe a good thing to do. So, what does it have to do with, um, with autism? What does it have to do with behavior? Well, remember that mouse? The mouse, that, if it was brave, um, it, you know, we took all the bacteria away from it and it became uber brave. Okay? Well, the bacteria in the gut are affecting what's going on in the brain. The bacteria in the gut interface with your immune system. Your immune system responds by infl inflammatory responses. You get an inflammation. And that interferes with your nervous system. And when your nervous system responds in your gut, like anyone should know, it tells your brain something. It sends nerve impulses up something called the vagus nerve, which goes into your brain and it changes your behavior. And we call this the gut-brain axis. That's the bacteria living inside your gut affecting your brain. And as my wife will tell you, the only way to my brain is through my gut. That's a very important thing to remember. Anyone who wants to buy me some food afterwards. Now, um, this is enabling us as researchers to figure out routes to treat conditions. So working with autistic patients, working with people with neurodevelopmental conditions, working with people with depression, which I'll talk about in a minute, we are developing clinical practices that help us to help those people by augmenting their biological experience, by adding those good bacteria back in at the point of the clinic so that we can help those people to live a higher quality of life. So when we consider depression, which is a major plague on our society, it's significantly one of the, one of the worst neurological problems that we suffer as a population. And nearly every person in the US will suffer some depressive episode at some point in their life. We fundamentally for years didn't understand what was going on. We worried about the id, you know, the, the psychological process. Well, again, I'm, a, I'm almost a mechanic. I want to figure out what the exact problem is. What's, what's broken in this system that's causing this? Well, what we found is that depressed people have a, a different bacterial community to people who aren't depressed. We actually see changes in their microbiome which can actually be used to induce um, depression in an animal model. I can, just the same way as I took the bacteria out of an obese person, I made the mouse obese, I can take bacteria out of a depressed person and make a mouse depressed. I'm not going to explain to you how I make mice depressed. It's not a pretty story, but um, it's, it's fascinating to me that I'm able to transfer that phenotype. It's a neurological phenotype, okay? And but what's interesting is we, for years, didn't know quite what triggered this. We knew that the bacteria were different, but we didn't know what was making those bacteria different. See, one of the key points to making those bacteria different is stress. St 
stress, um, psychological or physiological stress, whether you go in for surgery or whether your, your boyfriend just broke up with you, affects your body. It affects your body at the holistic level. Your immune system responds. And when your immune system responds, it starts selectively altering your bacteria that live inside you, those 100 trillion, that two pounds of bacterial mass right down here, it changes the organisms that are there. Like taking an antibiotic, it kills off certain organisms and allows others to flourish. And what we found out is that when the bacteria are changed by that immune response stimulated by stress, we see the bacteria in our gut changing and it changes the mechanism of their metabolism. So, good story. Anyone um, ever known that uh, urban myth that when you eat too much turkey, the tryptophan, the amino acid in the turkey, makes you sleepy? It's, let's just say it is true, because uh, Thanksgiving is coming up, and that might be an important component of um, our <laughs> after-dinner nap. But what's interesting is tryptophan metabolism actually in the gut generates serotonin. And serotonin, as many people will understand, is a very important chemical in neurological stability, in mental health stability, okay? What's interesting is when you suffer that stressful event, when your immune system selectively changes the bacteria in your gut, it, leave, it stops those bacteria from generating serotonin. And those bacteria start to generate kynuric acid, or kynurin pathway metabolism. That kynuric acid is a neurological neurotoxin. It actually starts to affect how the nerves in your body fire off signals between themselves. And it sends signals back up into the brain and it can cause depression. It can cause the, the, the effects, the neurological behavioral effects that we see in a depressed person. So we're starting to understand that maybe by augmenting those bacteria and bringing the right ones back into your body, potentially you could fundamentally change that pathway and stop yourself from feeling depressed. So what can you do about this? Well, you're in luck. You can't change your genome very easily. It's very difficult. You can't change um, uh, your, uh, your behavior necessarily. You can't change your brain. You can't swap out your brain for someone else. But you can change your microbiome. You change it every day. Change your diet. Maybe even augment your experience. I, um, I rescued, my wife made me rescue, this dog. His name is Captain Bo Diggley. He's from Kentucky. Um, he's a good southern dog. And um, Bo's been living with us now for three years, and he's been augmenting the microbiome experience of my children. People who uh, have a dog below the age of one have a 13% less uh, reduction in their asthmatic levels. So that it has a fundamental improvement in the biological health of an individual. So maybe go out and rescue a dog. Maybe augment your biological experience. Now, just finally, I don't want to change my son. My son's absolutely perfect just the way he is. I'm actually, I've got to the point where I'm happy. Thank you. We need the neurological and behavioral diversity that autistic people and people of many different types of behavior bring to our society. It's the only way we are as inventive and we can survive as a species. I believe this very wholeheartedly. So I've stopped trying to fix him. But in my expedition to find out how to fix him, I've uncovered many children who are suffering a terrible quality of life and many adults who are locked in. And it's for them that I'm trying to figure out ways to add to their microbial exposure and prevent them from suffering in the way they do. Thank you very much.